This lady changed my life. <laughs> you definitely changed mine. He rescued me more than 49 years ago from a little Pentecostal church that uh, God removed me from because I was obedient to obey those that had rule over me. I was casting out demons and healing the sick and they put a stop to it. So I said, I'm gonna obey the authority that's over me, but I know God, you're not gonna leave me in a place where I can't do what you've taught me to do. And in came my Boaz and rescued me. So he's my friend next to Jesus. He's my best friend. So Lord, I thank you for my Joseph and for the heart that he has for you and for the kingdom all the wisdom you have given him and the authority that he moves in, but most of all, how he loves your people. So I'm asking this afternoon that you would release from him the word of the Lord for this time that we all will be enriched and made better to do your work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a song that changed my life um, a number of years ago, back in the early um, early 90s, and um, written by a wonderful man of God in England. And um, the name of the song is All I Once Held Dear, but everybody knows the song by the name Knowing You. And so, uh, how many have ever heard that song, Knowing You? All right, how many have never heard the song, Knowing You? All right, how many people don't put your hand up for anything? All right. <laughs> okay, I know that feeling. I ain't putting my hand up because I don't know what I'm volunteering for. But what I'd like you to do is look at the words on the screen, if we can get them on the screen for just a moment. And... Um, As Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long. All right. <laughs> so let's do this. The, uh, Just instead of singing, let's just read the words, okay? Come on. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once, let's read it together, okay? All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. And then the chorus is knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Second verse, now my heart's desire is to know you more. How many would say I can relate to that? To be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Skip the chorus and we'll go to that last verse. To become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and never die. Last verse. Oh, to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings. To become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and never die, knowing you. Let's just sing the chorus and then we'll do the verses in a moment. Knowing you. Jesus, 
knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and I love you Lord and I love you And I love you, Lord. Amen. Tell God you love him. Just I love you, God. I have um, I've been learning how to walk with the Lord for a, a long time and one of the problems that I have is how often God is reluctant to see things my way. <clears throat> In fact, I can't ever recall a time when I've offered him a better idea than the one that he's offered me. And, and the Greeks created gods in their image. So they, they had flaws, they had all kinds of failures going on in their lives. But the people of God, I think one of the best illustrations I have for summing up what God wants from us is something that C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Great Divorce. He said, at the end of the age, there will be two groups of people, those who have said to God, your will be done, and those to whom God will say, your will be done. There are many things that I believe that we want from God but we want them to come in a certain way, a certain package. And more often than not, the package that God sends them in almost all ways, it's deceptive because we have a hard time, we have a hard time embracing it. We heard a conversation today and the name that I could not remember uh, of the theologian who was in Toronto was Guy Chevro and uh, amazing man and he he taught me a phrase that I have embraced and I have seen working out in a number of ways and he said there are times when God will do something in a certain place that you want but he attaches offense to it one of the best illustrations I have is this very wealthy warrior named Naaman who found out that there was a healing power in Israel and so he came expecting God to heal him and when he got there Elisha wouldn't even come out of the house he just said tell him to go dip in Jordan I guess that was almost like saying to him go jump in the river but uh, he said, something to go dip in Jordan three, four times. No, I'll make it an even seven. And, um, and, <laughs> and he'll be okay. And he was offended. And here's what he said. I thought he would come and lift his hand over the leper and declare me to be clean. And what's interesting to me uh, is that he had never been healed before didn't even know there was a healing, but now he knows how he ought to do it. And so, of course, you know the end of the story. He dipped in Jordan, the place of offense, because he says, we have better waters where I come from. But God healed him in the place where he was offended. And so he says, he calls it, 
and I'm speaking of Guy Chevreau now, he calls places like that the scandal of particularity. That God can be so particular about what he does that and his intention in what he does isn't really designed to attract you but to repel you. And you have to work past the repelling part in order to get to the good stuff. Revival is like that. Somebody said revival looks really great from a distance, but up close, it's chaos. But chaos necessarily precedes order. And many times when you want order, you are almost confronting with the thing that is creating all kinds of problems in your life. God, I want your purpose for my life. And then God sends his purpose and you say, um, that's not quite what I was thinking about, God. And so I want to share some thoughts with you that are birthed out of my own particular journey. And that in that journey, what I have found is that, the, that Moses says, you shall remember all the way the Lord has led you. A number of years ago, a friend of mine who didn't have the same kind of background that we had, uh, he heard me ridiculing some of the songs that we used to sing in our church and, um, and how, how untheological it was. One of the songs that I, we never sang in our church, but it was a particular song that another group sang and it was, it was called Drop Kick Me Jesus Over the Goalposts of Life. <laughs> And there was another song that I did hear them sing in our church. I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in the word of God. Man, that was a mess. Songs have this marvelous ability to mislead you in terms of what God has for you. And it's not really the theologians who are influencing the church, it's the songwriters because we sing more than we read and believe. And so because we're singing songs that have nothing to do with faith, they have nothing to do with victory, they have nothing to do with overcoming, it's like, if I can just make it in. And so we sing that song, it has kind of a, a minor key, slow, dragging feel. My brother's godmother told him, she said, in Noah's day, there were only eight people saved by water. She said, I doubt if there'll be that many this time. And then the killer was, oh God, please let me be one of them. Now, out of less than eight, she wants to be one of the seven. And she was a godly woman. And I'm thinking, man, if she doesn't know she's going to make it, I know I'm going to hell. But I learned that God is a merciful God and, and he, will, he will lead you and he will guide you and he will give you information you need to have. And what I want to say is this, is that in this present move of the Holy Spirit, there are a lot of voices that you can hear. There are a lot of folks who are saying, it's this and it's that and it ought to be this way. And uh, it's we call this speaking in tongues and the mainline charismatics called it glossolalia. And you want to be correct, but you still need to speak in tongues. What I have found is that it, it becomes important for me to understand that if I'm going to stand in the purpose of God and I'm going to do what God's called me to do, it becomes important for me to understand that I am, am not the master of other people. I'm God's servant. And so Paul says to the Corinthians, who are you to judge another person's servant? Before his master, he will stand or fall, and stand he will, for God is able to make him stand. I've been in meetings when I've heard people say negative things about men and women of God. And I think you can comment. I think you can say, 
uh, I, I love the way you said it. You know, there, there are a couple of things that I don't really agree with. And if you have to agree with everything that your wife says to you, you may as well just go to heaven. Because there are no choices in that place where you are. And so my wife and I, we've learned to share and we've learned to say, well, I just don't see it like that. I remember a guy coming home from hearing a great message on wives submitting to your husband spiritual authority. And he went home and he told his wife what he had learned and he said, you're going to submit. And she said, I'm not. He says, you are going to submit. She says, I'm not going to submit. And then uh, about two weeks later, he saw her out of one eye. Um, <laughs> if you follow God, say, if I follow God, there will be some things that some people can do that I can't. Say it again. If I follow God, there will be some things that people can do that I can't. We had a great service in our church a number of years ago. Holy Spirit moved with power. People got saved and there was a young guy. His hair was in a ponytail, blonde hair, ring glasses, boots, pants stuck in his boots and he just looked modern but he worshiped the whole time. And, uh, and I was watching him, I was leading worship that morning. And at the end of the service, I made an altar call and he came forward. At the end of the service itself, we were greeting people in our fellowship room and he was standing there and I said to him, are you okay? He said, yes. And I said, well, what was it like for you being here? He said, he said Father, I had a clergy collar on. He said, Father, for the first time in my life, I've been in a no BS worship service. He didn't say BS. <laughs> and I said, whoa. And I said, God, what's he trying to say? He said, that's his word for genuine. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, is it okay to use that word? <laughs> he said, not if you want to live. So say this, others may, you cannot. Say it again. Others may, you cannot. Go with me, please, to the book of Acts. And I'm going to share a lot of scripture with you. And I think I can be done before dinner time. Acts chapter 4. I can't read this passage anymore, Randy, without you wanting to know if you could ever be in a place where the place was shaken. And I'm reading this passage and seeing what happened. Go with me, please, on chapter 4 of the book of Acts. The apostles have been preaching, and God's been doing stuff. And he's healing people. They, they lay hands or grab a man who is lame from his mother's womb, pull him to his feet, and he goes running into the temple, and he's celebrating God. And the Pharisees or the religious leaders who also were the political leaders in that time, they said a notable miracle has happened that is going to shake the whole city. And if we don't stop this, they'll take it over. And so they tried to stop it. And I want you to see what the scripture says. I'm at verse 14 of Acts 4, seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the consul, they began to confer with one another saying, what shall we do with these men for the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them? It is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in his name, in this name. When they summoned them, they commanded them. Everybody say, they commanded them. Say it again, they commanded them. They commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John said to them, hey, you better back up because we're, we're on a mission from God. Don't be getting in our way because if you do all of that, God will wipe you out. You'll hear what I'm saying to you. Well, that's not what he said. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Others may, you cannot. I've been coming back to a, a major theme that we encountered in the early days of the charismatic renewal. And one was birthed out of a book by Watchman Nee called Spiritual Authority. And spiritual authority doesn't mean you have your own parking space with your name on it by the church. Spiritual authority means you understand that to have authority, you must be under authority. To have authority, you must be under authority. Would you say that? To have authority, you must be. Do you remember when Jesus encountered the centurion who said to him, my servant is ill, and Jesus says, I will come and I will heal him. This is in Matthew 8. And the centurion said to Jesus, you don't have to come. I also am a man under authority. I can say to one, go, and he comes. I can say to a servant, do this, and he does this. Sir, all you need to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus responded with these words. In all of Israel, I have not seen this kind of faith. And I think part of the problem is that we think faith is one thing and Jesus thinks faith is another. He calls it the obedience of faith. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus marveled, he spoke the word. When he spoke the word, your servant is healed. And I gotta get you this picture to you. When, and let me just back up a little bit. Maybe not back up, maybe just stop. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going away and for you it's gonna be a good thing. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. What are you saying, Jesus? Can you understand, they've been walking with him for three years and he's saying to them, I'm getting ready to go away and it will be to your advantage. And they're trying to figure out how in the world can that be to our advantage? And here's what I wanna say. When Jesus is here with them physically, he can be close to one guy more than the other. He can be close to three more than the other, but he can't be with everybody in the same way. So when, when they're in the room and Jesus is talking to them, John is leaning up against him and, and they're asking John, what's he talking about? John has that relationship with Jesus that has his head right on his bosom right here. John, what's he saying? What's he saying? But here's the thing. Jesus is saying, if I don't go, you won't have the kind of relationship with me that John has. John has it because I'm here. But if the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, every one of you can have the same kind of relationship with me that John has. I'll be with all of you. It's the same kind of relationship that Jesus had with the Holy Spirit. So that when he says, your servant is healed, the Holy Spirit knows that Jesus is a man under authority, who when he says something, Jesus says it like this, your servant is healed, and the Holy Spirit says, I've got this. Because when he says, the works that I do, you will do also, how are we going to do it? Through the same means that the Holy Spirit did with Jesus. Every demon Jesus cast out, he cast out by the Holy Spirit. Every miracle was done by the Holy Spirit. We're not going to do it any other way. Your servant's healed. Holy Spirit says, I've got that. Why? He's a man under authority. Now, here's my problem. 
There are people who don't recognize authority and they're still trying to do what Jesus did. And we don't understand. It don't work like that. Or it doesn't work like that. Two concepts. Submission is absolute. It's unconditional. There's never a time when it's okay not to submit. Obedience is relative. There are times when you can't obey. And when you can't obey and you know you can't obey, then you also know my obedience to God is greater than my fear of being disciplined. And so if it's going to take a whipping, I'm going to take a whipping, but I'm not going to lie. You can go back into the Old Testament. And if you don't bow down and worship me at the sound of the tablet, you're going to get thrown into the fire. And these guys, the three Hebrew guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, they, they looked at him. <laughs> Mishael, Hanani, and Azariah, all right. They said, we're not careful to answer you in this matter, but we are not going to do that. And if God doesn't deliver us, it's not because he can't. But if you expect us to bow, you got another, you got another expectation coming. They refused, even in the face. This guy is a, an authority. And I want you to see something with me now for just a moment. Go with me. Uh, let's look at some scriptures. You got your Bibles? How many have your Bibles with you? How many don't have a Bible? How many do not have a Bible? Raise your hand, be honest in this Holy Ghost atmosphere. A lot of people don't bring their Bible to church and I feel like it's because they've already memorized it. So it's so okay. I'm gonna read some passages, all right? This is Daniel chapter five. Most of these are coming from the New American, New American Standard Bible. Daniel five, verse 18. Daniel's been summoned by Belshazzar to explain the handwriting on the wall. And here's what Daniel says. O King, the Most High God, grant to sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king who believed he was the God. And he was crazy. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, men of every language feared, trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. Whomever he wished, he spared alive. Whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. Now listen to Jeremiah 26, 27 verse 6. Now I have given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. Jeremiah 28 verse 14. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, but they may serve, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. And I will, I have also given him the beasts of the field. Jeremiah 29, 5. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. You get the idea that God thinks Nebuchadnezzar is his servant. Now it's hard to figure that. How is Nebuchadnezzar a pagan, a man who, look, Nebuchadnezzar was so crazy, he said to the wise men, I've had a dream, I need you to tell me what it means. They said, well, tell me what the dream is. He says, no, I want you to tell me what the dream is and then I want you to interpret it. They said, no king has ever asked us. He says, I know you're stalling for time but my mind is made up. You can't tell me the dream, then I know you can't tell the interpretation. And if you don't do that, I'm not only gonna kill you, but I'm gonna kill your mama, I'm gonna kill your grandmama, I'm gonna kill your kids, and I'm gonna take everybody in your house and I'm gonna pull your house down on top of that. And that's it. That's it. Eek. The only reason he didn't do it is because the God of heaven 
gave Daniel not only the dream, but the interpretation. But I'm talking about somebody that God has put in charge who is crazy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go on. Isaiah 43, 10. Say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, behold, I'm going to send and get, I'm going to send and get Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I'm going to set his throne right over these stones that I have hidden, and he will spread his canopy over them. Now, if there's a verse in the Bible you all need to have in your treasure chest, it's Psalm 119, verse 91. Psalm 119, verse 91. They stand this day according to your ordinances, and here's the phrase, for all things are your servants. All things are your servants. There isn't anything going on in our universe that God can't use. There is no one in our universe that God can't use. Unfortunately, there are people who think that God didn't use them, God didn't choose them, and we don't have to recognize them. Now there's a scripture in Romans 13, I don't have time to look at it, just ask that in your prayer time you go and look at that verse that says, all authority that exists was ordained by God. All authority that exists was ordained by God. A number of years ago, I was a much younger preacher and I was naive. And it was during the time that Richard Nixon was the president of the United States and he was going through so many different things going on in his life. And, uh, and so the phrase that they were, had attached to him was the, the name Tricky Dick, meaning you couldn't trust him. Anybody remember that? Some of you are not old enough to remember that. But I remember standing on the platform and I had a really great message going. And I said, even if Tricky Dick tells you. And when I got finished saying Tricky Dick, I couldn't figure out what my next statement was gonna be. I didn't know what, I didn't know what to say. I was, I was, I was stunned. And, and, and for just a brief moment, I couldn't know that I had stepped across a line. And I said, God, I got to finish my message. I said, why can't I remember my next statement? He said, because you just slandered the president. I said, all I did was call him what everybody else is calling him. He said, others may. You can't. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Or Jeremiah says, don't learn the patterns or the traditions of the heathen. There are things that come out of the mouths of people who are not saved that should never even enter your mouth. And we want to serve God. I, God, I want to be an agent of change. I want to be an agent of your healing. And I want to say things that are, are going to produce life, death and life, death and life, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And many times we have a world that we did not think we would ever have because we created it with our words. If you say to your son as he's growing up, boy, you ain't never going to be anything when you grow up. Those are your words describing his future. And if he turns out to be nothing, it's your fault. So don't look at him and say, you never say, son. Get your act together. There's a multimillionaire in you. You're going to own land, properties. You can get a really nice house for your mom and dad. <laughs> Speak a future into existence that you want to see. But it's realizing that you and I have been given choices and to serve God. Can I take you to another passage? Go to Acts chapter 23. And uh, I'm hoping to sum all of this up without offending the devil. <clears throat> you, I don't care. Um, verse 1, Acts 23, verse 1. 
Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest, Ananias, commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God's going to strike you, you whitewash wall. He's just saying, hey, look, you're sitting in a place of authority and you're requiring me to be chastened contrary to that. He says it to him, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? But the bystanders, bystanders said to him, do you revile God's high priest? Are you slandering God's high priest? And Paul backed up. He said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest, for it is written. Everybody say, it is written. Say it again, it is written. Everybody say, it is written. Use your outside voice. It is written, come on, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Who shouldn't? Actually, nobody should. But if you're going to be somebody who carries the glory, you can't carry the glory and be a rebel. You can't carry the glory and have your own opinion about who should be president and who shouldn't be president or who should be appointed in the house or who shouldn't be appointed in the house. It's none of your business. Well, does submission mean you don't have your own mind? No, it doesn't. It means you shouldn't lose your mind trying to find your own mind. Don't be stupid. There's a verse that says that. How long will you be stupid? And I think the church needs to memorize that verse. Because we are practicing a stupidity birthed out of rebellion that began in heaven when Satan said, I will be like the Most High God and I will raise my throne above his. And I'm trying to cast out a demon. Do you know Paul said to the Corinthian church, he says, God waits until your obedience is complete and then I will avenge all disobedience. Is it possible that some demon won't come out because you've got the same one? Well, I don't think so, Bishop. I didn't think I had demons. I was casting out demons before I realized I had a few. I'm being transparent here. You probably don't want that much transparency. But we were in this service and I was commanding the spirit to come out as person. And I got intent because we had seen some amazing breakthroughs with this one person. And I just said, you foul demon, you come out. And because on a couple of occasions, whenever that thing would come out, they would respond with a belch or a burp or maybe even a sense of wanting to upchuck. And so I said, come out, come out in the name of Jesus, how you find your bitch. And then I felt this thing in my stomach like I wanted to throw up. I did, I just, and so I, I turned to my wife and a couple of others and said, why don't you all take this over right here? Just, just, because I knew that if I kept coming, commanding that demon to come out, it was out of me and that other person. And I wasn't ready to be embarrassed. <laughs> That's an interesting word. What I did was I chose my dignity over my deliverance. See, what, what people want from God is the power to do what God said we could do, but we want unbridled power, power that doesn't have any conditions associated with it, things that enable me to say, and I'm telling you, there are people in the church today who can heal, who can cast out demons, and who will stand before Jesus one day and said, in your name, we cast out demons, in your name, we did many wonderful works, and he, Jesus, will say to them, he won't say to them, no, you didn't. What he will say to them is that, but I never had an intimate relationship with you.
And when he says, I never knew you, meaning I never had an intimate relationship, you did it. And I don't mind you doing it. Anybody who casts out a demon in my name is doing a good work. But it doesn't mean you're good. The fact that God will heal people when you lay your hands on them isn't something about you, it's more something about him. Or Roberts tells the story about he was, he was ministering and he was ministering and he got really tired and he said, this is my last person I'm praying for. And as he, as he walked away, he walked out of the room and he's walking down the hall and a lady started chasing him. Brother Roberts, Brother Roberts, will you pray for me, please? I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, please pray. And he says, lady, I'm tired, I'm tired. She said, but please. And he said, I turned to her and said, okay, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And she started speaking in tongues. And as he walked away, God said, I didn't do that because of you. I did it because of me. A lot of times we think it's happening because of you. And it's not because of you. And it's the degree to which your heart and your soul are committed to serving God. We talked about this. And I think one of the things that the church fails to see is that so often when God is moving, so is the enemy. And we were speaking about this in our little conversation. Jesus casts out demons. Matthew says it one way, Luke says it another way. He says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. But another translation says, another version says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom has come upon you. The only other reference that you'll have for that phrase, the first reference at least, the finger of God, is when in Egypt, the magicians were able to reproduce every miracle that Moses and Aaron had produced until it came to fleas. And they couldn't produce fleas or gnats. And they said, well, why do you think? He says, I think this is the finger of God. The power of God. When God moves, he's moving. And you can interpret it any way you want. And that's why it becomes really important for you to back off when God's doing something. Even if you know something about how raggedy the life that is being lived by the person who's doing the miraculous, it's not your job to point that out. But I was at this great healing service and the person was there and you're there and you got information that every people, they don't have. And you say, yeah, but, but do you know anything about them? That's someone else's servant. You know anything about it? Yeah. Let me just tell you a little something just between you and me and the, and the fence posts. Preachers don't gossip, but they do invite you to pray. I'm not saying this because I don't put the burden, but I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just getting you to come in agreement with me for prayer for this brother because I hear he's got several things going on in his life right now. But, but he just did some great things in, in ministry. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But Now look, Holy Spirit is going to do stuff through people that you don't like. He's going to do stuff through people you don't agree with. He's going to do stuff through people that you don't think he should do stuff through. And he's not going to ask your permission to do it. He's going to let you explain it. He's going to let you try to figure it out. And the best way to figure it out is that that's God's doing. God did that. And I have nothing else to say about it. When I look at someone that God is using, whether in the secular world, in the religious world, when I, when I begin to see how clear that thing is, in fact, go with me to Matthew 12. You got to get your eyeballs on this passage. And um, Matthew chapter 12, for all those with the Bible and for those who memorized it. Listen to this passage. They have charged Jesus with casting out demons by Beelzebub. 
He said, I've done it by the Spirit of God. He says, when I do something by the Spirit of God and you say it's a demon, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Verse 32, verse 31, I say to you, sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Drop down with me now to verse 36. But I tell you that every careless or every idle word, somebody say idle, say idle. The idea that idle has nothing to do with it, but there's an interesting thing. It's, the word is translated careless in one place. It's a word that is spoken and should not have been spoken and you should have left it alone. But there's an interesting thing about the word idle because the Greek word for energy comes from the same word. But energy, in this particular passage, the word idle has an alpha prefix in front of it which negates it. So let me, let me paraphrase it this way. Every word spoken with negative energy you will give account of in the day of judgment. Every word spoken with a purpose for bringing about something that's contrary to its original purpose, you will give an account of in the day of judgment. Every word that you speak will be justified or condemned in your life. Now go with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes. When Jesus was preaching in the book of John, John captures it, Jesus says something like this. I am the bread sent down from heaven. Not bad. And then he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now he's talking to Orthodox Jews and they're looking at one another and saying, are you into this? No, oh, man, you can relate. I can't relate to that. Eat his flesh. What is this man talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? There's something wrong with that. And so they all begin to do what you do in a Pentecostal church when you want to leave before you get permission. And you're saying, I'm going. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm out of here. They left. And Jesus looked at his disciples, the ones who were still there, and he spoke to Peter and he said to Peter, actually he said to all of them, are you going to leave as well? And Peter's response indicates that they had thought about it. He said, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus says the problem is that you don't understand the words that I speak are Spirit and life. Say it. The words that I speak. I want you to say it now. Come on. The words that I speak are spirit. Uh, don't say life yet. The words that we speak are spirit. Words create worlds. Words create worlds. The writer of Hebrews says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by words. You and I frame our worlds with words. Look at this room, this room. This room, according to the apostles, was empty. There was nothing in it. It was a shell, but it's not like that now. Some words changed what goes on in here. I want carpet. What kind of carpet? Specific. I want a stage. What kind of stage? I want this. I want screens. Words can bring things to life when it seems like there's nothing else there. Your words have the potential for changing worlds, changing atmospheres, changing neighborhoods, and changing your own life. But they also have the, the purpose and they can bring about a negative view about so many things because you said it. I'm at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. 
And here's what I think Solomon is saying. I'm looking at chapter 10, verse 20. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king. And in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man. For a bird of the heavens will carry the sound and the winged creature will make the matter known. You're in your bedroom. In fact, one translation says, even in your thoughts. The risk that we have when we say things that are outside of our sphere of influence, the risk that we have when we speak concerning something that's taken place that was a move of God, is a move of God, and we put a negative connotation on it, we are creating either justification or condemnation in our world. And there are people in the world, honestly, who you and I don't agree with, but if they're God's servant, you got to say, God, I wish you could take care of that person. My wife understands submission. I didn't, but she did. And one day, because I had been pounding away at her with this idea of submit, submit, because I was good, because if she didn't agree, I'd just say, well, honey, just submit, just submit. And she would. Two concepts. Authority is like soap. The more you use it, the less you have. When you get married, God gives you a book of submission tickets. And you can use them all up in one year if you want to. But if you do, your next book comes from your wife. Okay. Somebody will explain that to you later. In the kingdom, when we are walking with Jesus, Jesus says, you see that person there? I say, yes. Who is that person? He's the mayor of our city. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for him. How do you want me to pray? First Timothy, pray for all of those who are in authority all of those who are in authority, that we may lead a peaceable and quiet life in all honesty and godliness, for God's desire is that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to be saved. That's his desire, but everybody doesn't want to be saved. And that's their problem. But you and I can't choose who we're going to pray for. And we can't choose who we're going to bless. And when God says, I've set up one and I'm pulling down another, you got to say, amen, then I'm just going to pray for that one. I don't have to like everybody that I'm told to pray for, but I'm going to say this. Daniel had influence with Nebuchadnezzar because he loved him. And we had this really bad nightmare Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, if this was only for you. Our president, our president, the Democrat president, the Republican president, na na na. Our president, no matter who you are, has COVID-19. Some people are saying, good. But those are words that have the potential for bringing condemnation. And you and I can't afford to say good. We can't afford to rejoice. We got to say, God, heal him. God, touch him. See, and I can pray really hard like that because I know that next to him is Mr. Pence and next to Mr. Pence is Miss Nancy. So I'm praying hard. I'm praying hard. Oh, God. Keep him alive. Keep Pence alive. But my task is to understand 
that you and I are called to be intercessors, prophetic people who call on God, who are willing to look at an Ahab and say, God just said, I'm going to keep this back. who are willing to look at other kings who have been out of order that God turned around. My God's a merciful God. How about yours? Now, get this in your heart. God, I don't want to be disqualified because I became the judge of somebody that you put in office. Get it right. Come on, stand up with me. So often when God sends an answer, the problem is that it didn't look like the answer you were expecting. And so then all you have then is to look at the effect of the person that God sent. I can remember praying and in the incredible season of intercession, when they were vetting Judge Thomas for a Supreme Court Justice. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and hearing God say to me, you need to intercede because his nomination is in trouble. And I began to pray hard, sincerely hard. And as he was being vetted and interrogated by senators on, on the panel that was determining his future, one of them was a guy by the name of Kennedy who had allowed a young girl to die in a car and drown because he didn't want to be associated with it. And it's, it's, it's history. And so as he is interrogating Justice Clarence or to be Justice Clarence, he is saying things there and I got so mad. And I looked at him on the screen and I said, who are you to judge somebody like him? And I had friends who knew that he was a man of quality. Who are you to judge somebody like him? And I'm screaming at the television. And the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me. You cannot be an authentic intercessor if you count any man's trespasses against him. You cannot be an authentic intercessor if you count anyone's trespass. You know what? We don't have the privilege of going into the Holy of Holies and saying good things about people that we need to say good things about, but then coming out of the Holy of Holies and saying anything we want to say, because what it makes you is a double agent. And I felt in that moment, okay, God, I want my perspective correct. I want you to lift your hands, just wherever you are, just lift your hands and say, Jesus, I want to do it your way. Say it again, Jesus, I want to do it your way. I want to be a man and woman of integrity. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to walk into the lion's den, knowing that you've already shut the lion's mouth. I want to speak healing, even to people who I don't like, but people you love. I want to be an authentic intercessor. And the only person at the end of the day I want to know is you. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteous. You're my all. You're my all. You're the best. 
You're my joy, my... Lift your voice, declare it. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Tell them you love him. And I love you, Lord. And I love you, Lord. Others may. You cannot. God bless you. Amen.